Well, good morning, and, and once again, if you're a father this morning, we want to thank you for being here. Happy Father's Day to you guys. We're so blessed for you um, to have you, and we're so grateful that the Lord has sent our fathers, our he- our earthly fathers, to uh, to shape us and to mold us. And we're so grateful for our heavenly Father. Because of Him, we have a hope and we have um, a future. And if you're watching on the live stream, um, Happy Father's Day to you, fathers, as well. Another thing I want to mention: this is um, this is kind of a big deal. It's actually the church's anniversary. This is the seventh year anniversary of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Um, Pastor Angel, yes. So when you think about it, year seven is kind of a milestone for a church plant. Uh, typically by year five, a church plant, very, very small percentage um, will continue to remain open. But all the glory goes to God. It's nothing that we've done personally as humans, but it's all the Lord's glory. So on June 19th of 2016 was the first, um, was the official uh, day that this church became a church. And I know when Pastor Angel gets back from vacation, he will um, probably tell you a little bit more about the history of the plant and um, just everything. And um, I'm very grateful for, for being a part of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. I've learned a lot from, from Angel, being a part of this church plant. And, um, and I'm sure everyone here is grateful for the fact that the Lord has um, established this church here in the Northeast. But I praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray for the church and for the Lord's work to continue um, here in Northeast El Paso and wherever else he desires to use us, right? Because it's the Lord's it's the Lord's work. Okay, so this morning we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. We're going to continue our journey through um, the letters to the seven churches there in Asia Minor. And last time um, I was up here, we talked about the church of Thyatira, and today we're going to focus on the church of Sardis. So the title of the message this morning is the feeble church, the feeble church, Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. So before we get into the study, uh, let me go ahead and pray once more, and then we'll look at this together this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, this beautiful time, Lord, another day to celebrate Father's Day, and also another day to celebrate our Heavenly Father, Lord. We thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you've brought us here. You brought us here for a reason, Lord. We pray that you fill this place, fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning. We know that you have something for us. We come here this morning expectantly, desiring to hear from you. And we just thank you so much, Lord God, that we have a loving Father in heaven who will never leave us nor forsake us. And you accept us, you love us, and we're just so grateful for that, Lord. We have a hope and we have a future. We pray this morning that once again you would speak to us through your word, that it would change us. Help us, Lord, to continue being molded and shaped into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you so much for this morning, for this time, for this privilege, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are there any cowboy fans in here this morning? Really? Okay, I thought people weren't going to admit they were cowboy fans. Um, If you're watching on the live stream, maybe you're a cowboy fan. Maybe just this morning, I don't know. Um... Now, the last time the Cowboys won a Super Bowl was in 1995 when they played the Pittsburgh Steelers. They won 27 to 17. That was over 28 years ago. And um, when you think about it, there are so many Cowboy fans, and you know what, I used to be one just like this, that live in the glory days of the late 90s. They live in the past. You know, oh, we're still America's team, right? They say that. And when you think about the Cowboys, they really haven't realized that they're not living up to the standards or to the reputation that the earlier teams have established for them. And for all the Cowboy fans out there, it's time to stop living in the past glory. You know, you need to stop living in the past because we don't, we're not there anymore. And, um, you know, on a more serious note, this can happen in the church as well, unfortunately. When you think about the church and the times that we're living in, It has brought so many solid churches to a state of compromise and progressiveness. And when you think about that, a lot of churches are changing the word of God to fit the changing world that we're living in. And I think what we need to learn quickly is that as a church, tolerance is not love and love is not tolerance. And that's something that we need to learn very quickly, especially in the days that we're living in. And such churches claim to be doing God's work but really all they're doing is living as a mere shadow of the glory that that church used to be. 
And when you think about this, it's just a reputation that they're not living up to. They're just holding on to the reputation, but they're not living up to the standards of that particular um, reputation. Now, one scholar put it this way. He said, spiritual ministries go through four stages. You have a man, that's stage one, a movement, which is stage two, a machine, which is stage three, and then a monument, which is that final stage. Now, those churches that are mere shadows of what they used to be or of their former splendor, they're said to be in that monument stage or that fourth and final stage. And in fact, today, we're going to look at such a church, a church that was in that so-called monument stage, and that's the church of Sardis, a church that was a shadow of its former self. This church, you see Sardis, was now lifeless. And when you think about Sardis, it had a reputation of being a lively Christian assembly. And now it was just a shadow of that. It only lived in its past glory, um, but it wasn't living up to that particular reputation. But the good thing is that in the Lord, there's always hope. Even for a church that's in a monument, cha- in a monument stage, just like we see here with the church of Sardis, which we're going to read about in just a little bit here. And I think the message this morning is a strong message, not just for Sardis, but also to all great churches that are living on past glory. And certainly in the times that we're living in, we can learn a lot from the church of Sardis and also from the fact that we as a church don't ever want to be in a situation where we're living in the past, but rather we're living in the present and looking to the future in Christ Jesus. So just a little bit of a background here. Um, So far, what we've talked about Number one, we talked about the church of Ephesus. That was a long time ago. That was a church that left their first love. We've talked about the church of Smyrna. That was the suffering church. We talked about the church of Pergamum, which was the compromising church. And then we talked about the church of Thyatira the last time I was up here, which was the corrupt church. And this morning, we're going to focus on the church of Sardis, which you can think of as like the feeble church. Okay. Now, when you think of the city of Sardis, Ancient Sardis was the capital of Lydia, and it was considered one of the most important cities in that time and in that particular place. It was about 50 miles east of Ephesus, and today it's basically an archaeological site, and its remnants are located in modern-day Turkey in the Manissa province near um, the town of Sart. Okay, so that's in modern-day Turkey. Now, Sardis means those escaping or renovating. And its location was actually in the junction of five main roads. It was a center for trade. It was also a military center. And it was well known for the manufacturing of woolen garments. Now, the main religion in the city was the worship of Artemis, which was apparently one of the nature cults, which built on the idea of death and rebirth, kind of like reincarnation. Now, Sardis also had a large temple that was dedicated to the mother goddess of Sibylle, And unfortunately, she was honored with a lot of sexual immorality and um, and impurity. And Sardis was also known for its softness and for its luxury. So clearly, when you think about Sardis, there were some serious worldly issues that were surrounding this particular church. And unfortunately, that was causing some issues with their walk and their relationship with the Lord, as we'll learn this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read the text, as we usually do. And then we'll look at the, um, the verses verse by verse. All right, so Revelation chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 1, this is the letter to Sardis. The word of God says here, write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who was the seven spirits, who has rather the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. 
All right. So the first thing we see here in this letter to the church of Sardis is that the Lord addresses this specific church, okay? And that is the very first part of verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, write to the angel of the church in Sardis. So as we've seen with the four other churches, the Lord is addressing this particular angel there in Sardis, which is considered a representative or perhaps the pastor of that particular um, church or assembly. But then as you move on to the second part of verse 1, Notice here that he introduces himself to this church. He says, Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So here the Lord begins by identifying himself as the one that's possessing the seven spirits and the seven stars. And in addressing the sevenfold spirit of God, this is referring to the Holy Spirit, okay? And when you think about the Holy Spirit, that's one spirit, which is full and complete. That's where the sevenfold comes from. And in fact, if you look in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, this is regarding the Holy Spirit. It says there, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in all. And we know that it is by the power in the person of the Holy Spirit, that is what gives life to the church. And if you remember on the day of Pentecost, if you think back to the book of Acts there in chapter 2, there are Dr. Luke documents for us, right? And there, if you remember, it was on that day in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit of God descended on the apostles, and that was the day that the church was born. And when you think about this, everything that is not done in the power in the person of the Holy Spirit is actually done in man's power. And we have to be very careful because nothing and absolutely nothing that is done in man's power is going to bring life to the church. It may seem like it can initially, but eventually it's going to be headed towards destruction very, very quickly. And when you think about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's a person. When you think about this, he's a person. And in fact, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4.30 tells us this. We can quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19 tells us this. And when we do that, unfortunately, the church begins to lose life and it begins to lose power. And when you think about the church, us, the body, we have to resolve those things with the Lord and also with one another before we can actually see renewal life in the church itself. Now, when you think about the number seven, right, because we're talking about the sevenfold spirit of God, which once again is the Holy Spirit, which is one spirit, which is full and complete, speaking of that sevenfold, um, the number seven represents fullness and completeness. We know this through the word of God. But when you think about the sevenfold spirit of God, which is the same spirit, the word of God has pictured this as seven burning lamps. So if you look, for example, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, there John is documenting for us a description of the throne room of heaven. And there he says, beginning in verse 5, he says, Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches or lamps were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So there we have another representation of the sevenfold spirit of God pictured here as these seven burning lamps or torches there in the, the throne room of heaven. Now, regarding the lampstands, remember in Revelation chapter 2, when the Lord was speaking to the church in Ephesus, he told them, hey, if you don't get right with me, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Remember, he had told them this. And by removing their lampstand, he'd be removing their light, which stems from the power in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, another area of scripture that comes to mind regarding lampstands is in the Gospel of Mark, for example. If you look there in Mark, um, in the fourth chapter specifically, uh, beginning in verse 21, there we have the parable of the lamp or the parable of the lampstand. And if you remember, the lamp or the lampstand represented the truths of God, which we know to be the Word of God. And we know that all truths of God 
have come from the inspiration and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 tells us that all scripture, God's truths, is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for everything, for every good work, rather. So once again, the sevenfold spirit of God, which is one spirit, but it's complete and it's full, has been represented as these seven lampstands, as we've read in scripture so far. But also in scripture, um, if you look in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, for example, the sevenfold spirit of God is also pictured as the seven all-seeing eyes. Okay, so there in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, there the Lord is described taking the scroll out of the right hand of the, the one seated on the throne. And there it says, then I saw, this is John documenting for us, one like the slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. So what we can see here or what we have pictured here of God, the spirit of God, is the all-knowing and all-seeing nature of God his omniscience, his omnipresence, right? That is what describes God. And we see this here described for us, for example, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, which is referring to the seven spirits of God. Now, another thing that is described here in this verse, as he describes himself, is these seven stars. It says, um, let me go back to the verse here. Uh, it says, uh, so that says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches or the messengers of these churches. If you look in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, it tells us, the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So what we see here is that these seven stars are the seven angels of those seven churches, just like we saw at the very beginning of verse 1 here. And the Lord controls those messengers as well as the church itself. Now, in the case of the church today, when you think about the messengers, um, you can think of that as like the pastors of the church or the leaders of the church. And you can think of that in the case of the church today. But in thinking about a dying church, which is kind of the theme of the, of the study this morning, um, often people think that a church is dying because of the congregation itself, like the people. Like, oh, the church is dying. It's the people's fault. But the truth of the matter is sometimes it's the pastor's fault that their church is dying because the pastor could be compromising, could be corrupt. He could be in a fellowship with the world and not in fellowship with the Lord. And a pastor can kill a church really, really quickly. And one thing that I've learned, and maybe you've learned in ministry, is that everyone is replaceable, very replaceable. And sometimes God has to remove the pastor or the leader of the church in order to put the church back in place where it needs to be. You see, God doesn't need us, but he desires to use us. He doesn't need us. We need him. And therefore, we don't ever want to put a pastor or a leader on a pedestal, but you want to put him on your prayer list because they need your, your, your prayers desperately. And I can tell you as a pastor and as a leader of this church, like I need you guys to pray for me. And I know Angel does too. We desperately need your prayers because all I really, all I am is a beggar trying to show other beggars where to find bread. And I need your prayers. Don't ever put us on a pedestal because we can kill the church. And we want to make sure that everything that we do for the Lord is in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see with, with um, Sardis is this wasn't the case. And we need to pray for the people that are leading us spiritually. And um, that way they can lead us by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. As much as we pray for you guys, we'd like you to pray for us too. So um, continue to pray for each other. Continue to pray for the leaders of the church, the pastors of, of the church. And not just this church, but all um, the churches. Now, if you look in the very last part of verse 1, the Lord tells them that he knows everything that's going on at this particular church. He knows their works, but unfortunately, he had something against them. It says there in the last part of verse 1, he says, I know your works. 
You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. So just as we saw with the other churches that we've talked about so far, the Lord knew everything about them. And just like he knows everything about us, and he knows everything about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, he knows our works, he knows everything that's going on here, and he knows everything that's going on in our hearts. Now, when it came to this particular church, the Church of Sardis, they had a reputation of being alive. However, they were no longer were living in this way. They really weren't alive anymore. And in fact, he tells them, he tells them what he has against them. He says, but you are dead. And notice he didn't point out any doctrinal problems. He didn't point out or mention any opposition or persecution that was taking place there. But rather, he mentions that they were dead. And perhaps they had grown comfortable. They had grown content. They were living on the past reputation. They were living in the glory days, you know, like the cowboy fans. Mm -hmm. But really... There was nothing taking place in this particular church. And this reputation was taking place without reality. And the impression we get here is that perhaps the church of Sardis was not proactive or aggressive in their witness to the city. There was no persecution, which means there was no invasion of the enemy's territory. You see, when something is dead, it shows no struggle, it shows no fight, and there's no persecution. And um, I think it was last week or maybe it was the week, the week before. Um, I was in the back there in the youth room. Sam was back there with me. I think, Jim, you were in there too. There was a cockroach coming in through the ceiling tile. It was really big. It had wings and, like, I don't know. I think it had glasses too. And um, it, was, it was in the ceiling tile. We had to kill it. And then I remember we killed it with the broom it was. You know, it was a pretty juicy one too. And after smashing it with the broom... The cockroach showed no struggle, it showed no fight, it no longer opposed us. It was dead. It was no longer a threat to us. But it's an awful place to be as a church when you're dead and you're no longer a threat to the enemy. Like, that's the worst place to be. And when the church is no longer a threat to the enemy, we're no longer a church anymore. We're just a group of people that gather, and we're not doing the Lord's work. If there is no motion in the church, then the church is dead, right? And I want you to think back to, I don't know, your high school physics class, right? The, the laws of Isaac Newton. Maybe you ditched that day. They taught everything that day when you ditched. But um, when you think about it, when, when a ball is rolling down a smooth hill, it's going to accelerate. It's going to move very, very quickly. And that's like when the church is on fire for the Lord and it's being led by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. It's taking a lot of ground. It's taking a lot of real estate. We want to do that. We want to take a lot of ground and a lot of real estate from the enemy. At that point, we are a great threat. But let's say you have a ball on a flat surface, and it's really, it's a rough surface. The ball is not going to be moving very much, or it's going to be staying in place. At that point, we're not taking any real estate, really, really not doing anything. We're not a big threat to the enemy. And that's not a place we want to be. And when you think about this, the people that were not believers there in Sardis, they saw this church and they probably saw them as respectable people that were not a danger and they also were not desirable. And as a church in the Lord, in Christ Jesus, we need to be so different that the world sees us and there's something about us that's desirable, that's different. Like, hey, I want to be a part of that. But how awful to think that that society, they saw this church and there was nothing desirable about them. They didn't want to be a part of them. There was nothing different about them. Now, one scholar put it this way. The church of Sardis was at peace, but it was the peace of the dead. And that's a very sad place to be, to be at peace when you're doing absolutely nothing for the Lord. I think when the conviction and all of that goes away, then obviously there's some issues. And certainly we don't want to be a church that is in a place um, like this. Now, as we move on to the next few verses, uh, the Lord here is specific on what this particular church needs to do. Okay, so this is verses 2 through 4. Um, the Word of God says there, Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. 
If you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. So in reading these, uh, these verses here, it kind of reminded me of the following scriptures. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 tells us, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? So the first thing that the Lord tells them is to be watchful and to wake up and to strengthen what remained. And, you know, the first step to revival or to renewal is to recognize that something's actually wrong. Right? If you don't recognize that something's wrong, then you're not going to fix what's wrong, right? Um, and this is why we need to continuously evaluate ourselves, as we've read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And the way that we can evaluate ourselves is through prayer and through reading God's word. You know, when you think about reading God's word, the truths of God's, God's word, and of course the Holy Spirit, the things in our life that don't belong there, all the dross in our lives starts to become apparent to us. And then once we recognize like, oh, wow, like this is still in my life, those are the things that we can begin to work on and remove from our lives. So this is something that we need to be doing daily, maybe even minutely some days because of the day we're having. And we have to remove those things from our lives. And the only way we can do that is by recognizing that there's a problem. And this is what this church needed to do. You see, though the spiritual condition of Sardis was not good, there was still hope, as there is always hope in the Lord, right? There's always still some hope. And they needed to strengthen what was remaining. Now, this morning, if your spiritual condition is not very good, don't lose hope. But you have to do your part too. You have to recognize that, and you have to work on what remains to strengthen what is there. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in just a little bit here as we rekindle that fire that once was. You see, they had to recognize that that church was not dying, but rather it was already dead. But it wasn't too late. And God's so good because in the Lord, it's never too late. But notice that the Lord tells them, he says, for I have not found your works complete before my God. So what this shows us here is that there was works present in that church. Like there were some good things happening. But they did not measure up, however, to God's standard. And we know from the epistle of James that faith without works is dead and works without faith is dead. You see, the presence of works isn't enough because God looks at our heart, our intent, our reason, our why for doing the things we do for him. And when you think about it, those works should come. They stem from our faith in the Lord, which allows us to do them with a heart and in a manner that shows them to be perfect before God. Now, it may be that maybe they performed things, and maybe they were doing it like as a routine. They, weren't, they were just kind of going through the motions, perhaps. Um, maybe they were constantly beginning things, but they weren't finishing things. They weren't bringing them to proper end. And I was kind of thinking about this, and you know, I don't know if this is like, like if this is a Mexican thing or a Latino thing, but like you have that one uncle whose house has been under construction for like 25 years, right? Like they start a bathroom and they don't finish it. They start the room, they don't finish it. There's materials all over the house, right? Now, <laughs> that's not the way we want to serve the Lord, right? We want to complete the things that he's started in us. We don't ever want to be um, in that situation where it's just continuously under construction. Now, we personally are continuously under construction, right? until we see the Lord face to face. But the things we do for him, we want to bring them to completion because they're for the Lord. They're not for us. They're not for the pastor. They're not for the leaders of the church. They're for the Lord. It's all about him. And that's why we have to raise that standard. But unfortunately, this wasn't happening there in the church of Sardis. Now, if you look in the beginning of verse three, he tells them, remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. Repent. So the Lord tells them here to hold fast to the truths or to the word of God, his word, and to repent of their lifelessness. 
And we know that the word of God has that transforming power. And when you think about it, that's what leads us to repentance. It's led us to repentance, right? And as believers this morning, we know that that transforming power, because it is the word of God, and we put our faith in the word of God, has changed us in addition to the power in the person of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what's changed us. And it's continuously changing us, right? We're not perfect. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 reminds us of this. Here, Paul's speaking to the church there in Thessalonica. He says, this is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God which also works effectively in you who believe. And we know that to be true as believers this morning. Now, in the latter part of verse 3, he says, If you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. So here he tells them that if they were not watchful, that he would come to them unexpectedly and bring immediate judgment. And similarly, as believers this morning, we too need to live in a way that is watchful. Living in a way that we know the Lord's return is imminent. Or in other words, the Lord could come back right now. He could come back at any moment, right? And when you think about it, if you were to come back right now in this moment, and what you're doing in this moment, would it honor the Lord? And yeah, we're all in church right now, but the Lord's going to look at your heart. Where's your heart this morning? as we go through this study together. And that's what the Lord's going to look at. And we have to live in that way, like the Apostle Paul, right? He talks about this. Living in a way where we know he could come back at any moment. And that certainly gives you that healthy fear of the Lord, and it helps you live in the ways that he desires us to live. Now, the Word of God tells us exactly how we should be living. And in fact, this is expressed, for example, for us in the Gospel of Mark. If you look in Mark chapter 13, Beginning in verse 32 to verse 37, it says there, Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Not even Jesus knows. Only the Father knows. The Word of God says there in verse 33, Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. It is like a man on a journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, gave each one his work and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, be alert, since you don't know when the master of the house is coming, speaking of the Lord, whether in the evening or at midnight or at the crowing of the rooster or early in the morning. Otherwise, when he comes suddenly, he might find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. And we as believers need to be alert, right? Constantly evaluating ourselves and doing the Lord's work that he's called us um, to do. Now, we've seen similar warnings to some of the other churches that we've covered so far. So, for example, the church of Ephesus, um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. He says, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent. They had left their first love, remember. And do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And then remember what he told the church in Pergamum? Revelation chapter 2, verse 16, he says, So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, if you look in verse 4, here we have a glimpse of hope, a glimpse of light. He tells them, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. So even in this dying church, in any dying situation, I guess, regarding the church, there will always be a remnant of dedicated people. And this kind of reminded me of the remnant of Israelites. Remember when they um, had remained, or that remained after the Babylonian exile? There was that remnant. And it was those few that will reignite um, the light that once was. Now, if you remember back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, In Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, here in reference to the church of Pergamum and Thyatira, remember they had a few bad people or bad apples among the church. But unfortunately for Sardis, it was the other way around. They only had a few good people among the church. So you you say to yourself, wow, the odds are not good for them. But 
in the Lord, nothing is impossible. And it was this remnant of believers that had not defiled their clothes that were going to bring this church back to life. Now, what does it mean by they did not defile their clothes? You know, they did not break dress code. What, what does that even mean? Well, apparently in that time, when you think about the temple worshiping of false idols that was taking place, um, apparently when they would go and worship their gods or their goddesses, little g gods or little g goddesses, wearing dirty clothes and garments, um, they were not allowed to do it with dirty clothes or with dirty garments is what I was trying to say here. But the remnant here that was walking with the Lord did not compromise with the world around them that was taking place. So all of this pagan worship and society around them did not infiltrate these, um, these few remnant individuals. And it was this group of people that would carry the future of that church's ministry. And notice that the Lord promises something regarding these people. He says, and they, speaking of that remnant, will walk with me in white because they are worthy. And this shows us that they would walk in close fellowship and friendship with God. And the white garment also signifies purity, triumph, and in this case, the ultimate triumph in, um, in Christ Jesus. And hearing those words from the Lord saying that we will walk, you know, walk with me, you know, regarding the remnants. But of course, if he says that about us, like that is the greatest reward we can receive, walking with the Lord. And I know right now we walk with the Lord through the word of God, through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. But one of these days we're going to walk with him side by side, face to face. And that's something we are looking forward to. Remember what the promises we have in the word of God, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for our savior from here, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just pilgrims in this land. Matthew 5.8 reminds us, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see um, God. So there's so much to look forward to. And you know, we can confidently say this morning that in Christ Jesus, the best is still yet to come. And certainly that's an incentive to continue walking with him now. And one of these days, we'll walk with him face to face, side by side. And, um, and that's something I'm really looking forward to. And I'm sure all of you guys are looking forward to. God is so good. Now, if you look in verse 5, he promises a reward for those that would repent and would change their ways. So here in verse 5, it says, In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes. And I will never erase his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. So here, the Lord is not talking about the remnant of believers that are already right with him and hadn't defiled their garments, but rather he's speaking of those that would listen, that would repent and would overcome, okay, within that population. Their righteous acts would mark them as true believers. Now, when you remember, when you think about rather that city, it was known for woolen garments. It was a manufacturer of woolen garments. So this statement of being dressed in white clothes was probably very meaningful to them. And for us as believers, being clothed by God with his righteousness, with his purity, that is extremely meaningful to us as believers this morning. And a nice, a nice picture of this can be found, for example, in the parable of the wedding feast. And one place you can find that is in Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 through 14. There it says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. So he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And yeah, that is a scary thing. But in Christ Jesus, what a blessing and what a privilege to be considered a child of the Most High and to be clothed in the garments of purity and righteousness. There's nothing better than that. Now, in this verse, the Lord also says, And I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, this is an interesting verse. Now, you may maybe be thinking to yourself, does this mean someone can lose their salvation? Is God up there taking note and taking names and like scratching names off? 
You know, like that kid in second grade who took names on the board? Um, no, we, need to, we just need to really consider this very carefully. Now, when you think about the context of this verse, what he's referring to here is assurance. Now, the first thing I want to address is the book of life. What is the book of life? If you look in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, there, that's speaking of the great white throne judgment of the Lord. It says there, beginning in verse 12, this is John documenting for us. He says, I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Now, the book of life is very important because it determines who will spend eternity with the Lord and who will spend eternity in hell. Revelation 20 verse 15 tells us, And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, if you look in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, Revelation chapter 17 also in verse 8, these two verses suggest that the names of those that are saved were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. In other words, from the beginning, the names were in that book. Just as you and I were chosen from the beginning of time, as we see, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 34, there it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And also, if you look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, there Paul documents for us, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in, in love before him. And we are enrolled in heaven because we've been born again, right? The author of Hebrews tells us this in that 12th chapter. And when we're born again as true believers, a true rebirth, okay, because there's a lot of make-believers out there too, we are eternally secure. And in fact, if you look at John 3.16, the Word of God tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will never perish, but shall have everlasting life. John 5 verse 24 tells us, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. That word everlasting means everlasting, right? And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And then John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29 tells us, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And to further support this, do you remember what the Lord told the 72? Remember they had sent them out in pairs? If you look, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, beginning in chapter 10, there in verse 20, remember there that the 72 that had been sent out, sent out in pairs, they had performed miracles in the Lord's name, and they were joyful. They had come back and they told the Lord, hey, even the, demon, the demons, rather, they submit to your name. And then he told them, however, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, in that phrase, written in heaven, the Greek verb there that is used is in the perfect tense. So in other words, you can translate it like this. It could say, your names have been written in heaven and are on permanent record up there. So the Lord certainly would not contradict himself. And I think as believers this morning, there's great joy knowing that in Christ Jesus this morning, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that our names are written in the book of life, and they're there forever. Now, there are five references in the word of God that talk about names being blotted out or erased from the book of life. One of those places is in Exodus chapter 32, verse 32. Another one is in Exodus chapter 32, 33. Psalm 69, verse 28. Here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. And then later in Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. 
Now, some scholars suggest that these references were perhaps symbolic of a person's name that was never really there to begin with. And we know that there's going to be people in our midst that appear to be saved in every way possible, but we're not going to see them in heaven because they never really believed, but they gave the impression that they did. And in fact, Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it, it reminds us of this. The word of the Lord tells us, or the Lord speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, don't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. And those are probably the most awful words you could hear. Depart from me, I never knew you, you lawbreakers. Now, being born of Adam doesn't guarantee our name will be written in the book of life, but being born again in Christ Jesus ensures we will be written in the book of life. And I think to summarize all of this information, and it was kind of a lot in this, in this small section here, everything that we've talked about, what is meant to be shown here is that the overcomers in this particular church were assured of their heavenly citizenship, just as we are in Christ Jesus. And don't ever doubt that. You see, there's a difference between losing your salvation and leaving your salvation. When you lose something, you don't know where to find it. But if you leave something, you know exactly where to find it, right? So if you lose your salvation, you can't lose your salvation rather because you don't know where to find it. That means you never knew it. But if you leave your salvation, you know exactly where to find it. And what that suggests is maybe some backsliding that we've all you know, experienced at some point in our lives perhaps. But you can only leave your salvation. You can't lose it. And that's something we can confide in this morning. And that's why we have to constantly evaluate ourselves because we don't want to leave it. We want to be in it, right? And then lastly... The Lord promises here that he would confess their names of the overcomers before his father and the angels in heaven. And how cool is that to be mentioned to, to, to the Lord in that way, to God the Father? Um, that's, that's, really, that's really a wonderful thing. But then notice in the last verse, we have this final exhortation for the church. He says, let anyone who has ears to, to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, as we, as, as we saw, you know, with these other churches, um, there, was this, there was these warnings, but it really was up to them to listen and to heed these warnings. And this is what we see here as well. You know, it was up to the congregates here that he called to hear his warning and to take heed. And now it was up to them to re-erect this church, the life of this church that used to be. And this whole time they were just living in the glory of the past. So in closing this morning, there were several things that we talked about regarding the church here in Sardis. And the warning to us this morning is the following. Number one, as a church, we never want to grow comfortable or complacent, or we will find ourselves slowly dying. And we need to be watchful, not prideful. You know, never think that, oh, that could never happen to our church, because it can. And it's because of us, right? Right. We're the problem. It's the people, right? We're the ones that cause these issues at the church. And that's why we have to hold fast to the truths of God, just as he told the church there in Sardis. And secondly, just as we saw with the church of Sardis, no dying church is beyond hope, as long as there's a remnant willing to re-erect and to rekindle the spark that once existed or once was there. Thirdly, we never want to live on past glory but continue to live up to the legacy that the Lord himself has left behind and has revealed to us um, through his word. Now, often you hear people say, you know, why can't we be more like the early church? The days of the early church. You know, we're a mere shadow of what the church used to be. And maybe we are. But the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit that was in the church then is the same Holy Spirit that's in us now and in the church today. And we as believers just need to surrender be willing and not conform to the world around us. We live in a time where there's so much compromise and there's so much corruption from the world that has infiltrated the church and there's so much progressiveness in the church these days. We need to quickly learn that tolerance is not love and love is not tolerance. And we have to be very careful of that. I know for me personally, as a follower of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, 
as a servant, as a member, as an, and, and as a leader, and as a pastor here at this church at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. I never want this church to be living on the past glory of what we call Calvary Chapel. And I don't want to be a monument church like the Church of Sardis that we've read about this morning. And I can tell you there's a lot of churches out there that claim to be Calvary chapels, but are far from the legacy that the Lord has established through Pastor Chuck because of compromise and because of progressiveness that has infiltrated that particular church. Yet they live on the past glory because they carry the name Calvary Chapel, but they're really dead, like this church here in Sardis. We never want to be like that. You see, it's good to guard our spiritual heritage, but we must not embalm it because it's not good enough to have some faith and to have a great history. That faith has to have life and it has to produce works. Like there has to be something to show for that. Now, let me be clear here. All of this that we do, it's not a Calvary Chapel thing. It's a Jesus thing. But it's through Calvary Chapel that the Lord has pointed many to Jesus Christ, me included. And that's something I want to continue to be a part of and to carry on and not just be something that happened in the past. You see, I've experienced the transforming power of the Lord through his word, through the Holy Spirit, because of Calvary Chapel. And I want to make sure that I give others that same opportunity because we all want to have a hope and we all want to have a future. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, so live for the kingdom of God. Seek to bring glory to Jesus Christ and the Lord will use you. It is my prayer, my constant and daily prayer, that God would keep me usable. And that should be our prayer too, daily. And then lastly, and I'll close with this, the Lord reminds us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. He says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So let's continue moving steadfastly together as a church body in the direction that the Lord desires us to move us. That way we can point many, many people to Jesus Christ and take real estate away from the enemy. Amen? So this morning, if you're here in person or maybe you're watching on the live stream and um, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity today. And um, today is Father's Day. And I do want to remind you Yes, you have an earthly father that the Lord has given to you, but you also have a heavenly father who loves you, who will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you want to declare him as your Lord and Savior this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. But you have to do this with your whole heart. You can't be just this make-believer. You have to be a true believer. You have to say this with all your heart. You have to mean this with all of your being. So if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to just repeat this prayer after me. And... Um, once again, you have to say this with all your heart. This can't just be your lip service onto the Lord. So if that's you this morning, if you would just close your eyes and, and bow your head and just repeat this prayer with me or after me. Heavenly Father, this morning, I want to declare, declare you rather as my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried and I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I know that I am a sinner. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me. And please use me for your glory, Lord. I pray these things. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of God. And as we always say here, even when one sinner repents, there's a celebration going on in heaven amongst the angels. And um, there's, there's some excitement up there going on on your behalf. And if you have any questions, maybe about your next step, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, anything like that, please reach out to the church. Uh, we meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Um, our building is at 4242 Hondo Pass in the, um, I forget what this, uh, this strip mall is called, but we're at the very end, the far uh, east side of the building at the intersection of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. And we do invite you to come by and visit us. And um, if you're a father this morning watching on the live stream, and even here in person, we want to thank you so much for everything that you've done for your children and um, just for allowing the Lord to use you to shape them and mold them into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, which he has sent for all of us. And um, the rest of us, the rest of you that are watching that are not fathers, we pray that you have a blessed week and um, we're praying for you. We love you and uh, we hope to see you again very soon here. So goodbye for now.